okay, I think we're going to get started um, with our editing translations panel. Um, we have some, you guys can read all the descriptions of everyone in their bios in the back, but I'll just introduce, we have Anna Rosenwang, <coughs> David Shuck, Chris Fischbach, and Kaya Stramanis um, from Phoneme Media, Coffeehouse Press, and Open Letter. Um, and the purpose of this panel, this came about <coughs> after. <laughs> <laughs> so answer it, answer <laughs> it. <laughs> it's a translator calling with the editing question, probably. Um, the, this came about because last spring at the New German Literature Festival in New York, <coughs> Sal Robinson, who used to work at, um, with, at Harcourt with Drinka Willen and worked at Melville House and is now like freelancing and, and in school, she set up this um, <coughs> panel that I was trying to emulate here in which she brought together three translators and their editors to talk about very specific works that they had edited. So we had like, one of a, we did a book, a huge anthology called A Thousand Forests and One Acorn of all Spanish language writing. And one of the people who had translated one of the pieces in there spoke with me about like how we had to find the right, the right word choices, how we had to change all the punctuation to make this, this particular story work. And Michael Reynolds was there talking with, um, Tim Moore about how uh, Michael, Michael absolutely insists that he will not change anything in text, like any, any errors or things that you want to shift or do differently, he's very opposed to that. And it ended up being a really fascinating conversation and something that a lot of the people that attended had never really had experience with. Like they had never been edited in that way, they never thought about the process of how editing a translation <laughs> differs from editing uh, text that is written in English, how far an editor will go or won't go, where the limits were. And so I thought that that would be something that would be of interest to people here at Alta as well. So we tried to replicate that. We had a few minor differences, one being that Chris and, and Kaya don't have their translators with them, so we get, a, we, get a, we get a sort of fill in for them, although Heather clearly is in the audience and uh, has worked with Kaya, there she is, has worked with Kaya on a few books and um, can sort of talk to that from the back. Also, um, I do want this to be, I will go through and have questions for each one of the, the pairings, I guess, or the, the, the panelists, but I do think that we should open it up too. So anytime that you guys have a question or want to know something or have an opinion, Feel free to speak up. I think that this should be more of a round table and a discussion about editing translations rather than us like explaining and pitching things. So let's start with you guys, David and Anna. Um, they recently, as it would have been last spring, um, published Diorama by Rocio Cerrone, which ended up winning a poetry collection of poetry and it won the Best Translated Book Award for poetry, um, which congratulations again um, to both of you. And um, yeah, absolutely. And um, so I thought it would be good if you guys talk for a minute about how you two work together on this. You're the you're the one that's representing poetry up here too, which is always a little bit different, I think, yeah. to people like me, who yeah. I only work with fiction. I never edit poetry, and I don't even know. I would I would have questions about to myself about what what I would be doing as an editor of a of mm -hmm. a book of poetry. So if you want to talk for a bit about your experience and how you two work together, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I don't want to make Anna blush so early in the panel, but I think the translation of Diorama as it came to me was one of the cleanest manuscripts I'd ever seen. Thanks. I think, um, you know, I was pulling up some of our conversations and some of the early typesets of this book in preparation for this, and I was, you know, kind of disappointed there wasn't more. <laughs> Uh, to talk about, uh, but I think that speaks to the quality of the book. I did find a, a funny email, and I remember writing it because I was a little nervous, um, but I, I had thought that, and if you see Diorama, which is available at the book show, if, it, the if nice it's still available, book yeah, it, it may be out. sold no, out. Kidding. Hurry, rush over there <laughs> after this. The coffee will still be there. And um, I felt like the poem, in some sense, was was the um, the pacing was so important that I didn't want to interrupt it with facing pages, and I wrote this kind of uh, very long email uh, to basically propose the idea to Rocio and Anna, you know, suggesting that we put the whole translation into English first, followed by the entire poem in Spanish. And uh, Anna, of course, was, uh, she wrote me from Cusco, in fact, hey, I see. My and uh, she was totally in favor of it. And, and I'll step in to say that, um, that that's, Facing Pages um, 
have their place and are sometimes really interesting, but I had always been squeamish about them and felt sort of empowered uh, by a conversation that I had with um, Pura Lopez Colomé, who said that, who told me that she didn't allow anyone to publish her in, in Alfas editions because she felt that it made a spectacle of the translation work in a way that was counterproductive to people focusing on her poetry and on the translation, as the poetry of the translation that her translator Forrest Gander would do, and that um, she felt that anyone who was interested in looking at it in a scholarly way or in studying and needed to be looking at minute differences could certainly flip back and forth, but she wanted the poetry to stand. So I was thrilled that I didn't. I, w I had been planning, I had been gearing up to fight for that. And when David said, can, is it all right with you? Can we do that? I said, that, that sounds good. Let's do that. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, wasted were, anxiety. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of, of edits to the manuscript, in this case, because I speak and read and translate from the Spanish, I did have a few small questions. I remember one question about uh, a blueberry chocolate chip muffin, mm -hmm. and uh, that that was originally a chocolate chip muffin with blueberries, I think. So the edits in this book were really, it was profound. <laughs> <laughs> But there were, there were like three, three instances of that, basically. And yeah. you know, and then in, in the translator's preface, which I think is, is awesome. I highly recommend it to you. Even if uh, you don't want to buy the book, you can read the preface for free <laughs> in, the, uh, in the bookstore. And uh, then kind of, you know, like one funny thing I noticed was uh, updating the name of the drug Lozum to Lorazepam, which is, you know, they're both accurate in English, but Lorazepam is a little more common. Um, I typically, especially in, in poetry, you know, I tell my translators, if you feel really strongly about a decision that I'm questioning, explain it to me, and odds are I, I will accept your, your reasoning. And I think that um, I'm going to surmise that part of the reason that we didn't have a very involved editing process um, was because this was such a, uh, such a dense, languagey text, right? And, um, I edit fiction, actually. Where the way I make money is not translating. I haven't, like many of us haven't figured out how to make very much money doing that. But um, I, I edit uh, novels, substantive and developmental editing, and a lot of them translated and, um, and make all manner of changes. I mean, rewrite the things. And, and I think a lot about the translators. And I work with the translators and how um, terrified I would be to be subjected to my editing. But I think it's very different because it's fiction. And when I've edited poetry, especially very sort of dense, languagey poetry, um, it's all so carefully. And why the you know why it was so clean? Partly because I'm an editor, maybe, mm -hmm. and partly because when you're laboring over every word and line break that way in you know experimental or difficult poetry, there aren't going to be a lot of sort of errors that got elided because you were just going with the flow of the story or. Um, when there's something like the blueberry chocolate chip muffin, probably you spent time thinking or even talking to the author about like, well, you know, are the, is it meant to be primarily a blueberry muffin? Because in this <laughs> strange political <laughs> metaphor she's got going on, am I supposed to read the blueberries as something? You know, um, and so I think, and the, and the fact that David had already chosen this book before I got involved, this wasn't something that I was pitching. So we were already seeing this book as it was and, um, and, and had a similar vision for how to understand it. And so I think because of that, all these things were syncing up in a way that it didn't make as much sense because I already knew what I was doing before. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's very true to my experience too for a number of reasons. You know, the most recent novel we published, which is about 220 pages, I think, I was looking over the uh, the track changes and comments between, you know, that I'd made, that our copy editor and proofreader had made, there's something in the range of 6,500 uh, compared to the 47 notes I see on this book, uh, which are mostly notes for the typesetter. How do you, do you <coughs> could you uh, articulate your approach, at how it's different for the fiction when you're editing that and why you end up with so many more? Is there, is there something that you feel more free in, in editing fiction or... I think there is a sense of that. One, there's, um, 
I think I feel more committed to a compelling or propulsive narrative, mm -hmm. and uh, that's very, very much a priority when editing fiction. I also think part of it is just the way that translators of poetry work. You know, most of the the poetry manuscripts I'm seeing are things that a lot of times poets have been working on for five years or more. You know, like they've had a lot of time to do a lot of the editing themselves. That's fair enough. And, and it's an audience issue, right? I mean, well, a lot of the fiction that uh, press like Phoneme and what David's interested in is um, more literary and more experimental, but nonetheless, you're looking at a broader audience and um, and in terms of the stuff that I work on, editing, uh, sometimes a very, very broad audience. Um, and so you have to be thinking a lot more about how it's playing. And you know, something like this, if we're looking at the spectrum of bringing readers to uh, authors or texts or texts, right, you're, you're really so embedded in the language when it's practically language poetry. But um, if you're thinking about story and uh, it's, it's a whole different, I think it makes sense to do so much more editing um, on that kind of text. This is a question that can actually lead into your story too, Chris. Is um, so when you're talking about editing the fiction, how much are you willing to change the original book when you're editing the translation? Um, like, what what is your limit? Do you feel comfortable with that? Do you tend to that? Down? This is a question for you initially, David. But I know that Chris's story about Valeria Luiselli's book really kind of falls into that same idea. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> I like. I ventured into public or editing translation um, very naively, and it turns out that by starting with Valeria Luiselli, um, it, it, she doesn't. She's very interested in messing with and ignoring um, conventions around translation and publishing, and international boundaries. Um, so I'm not necessarily being trained well, but it's a very fun. Um, so she works very closely with Christina McSweeney. Uh, Story of My Teeth was published by Sexto Piso and. Um, then Christina did two drafts, working closely with Valeria, and then sent me the English version. Now, um, I met with Valeria in New York, and she told me that she she's studying um, comparative literature at Columbia, so she's also extremely fluent in writing. You know, wrote her thesis in English um, as well, so she could have written the entire book in English, but she wrote in Spanish. Um, and so she became very interested in her studies in what she's described as the Anglo-American editor-author relationship. And that was something that she wanted um, to experiment with. And so she wanted me to feel very free to make any kind of recommendation that I wanted with the book. And that she also had some ideas that she wanted to change and restructure. Um, and I said, first of all, like, well, is Eduardo okay with that? <laughs> you know, at Sexo Piso, and she's like, "Yes, that's fine." And I found out late at this year's Frankfurt that actually, what she does with him is she has different. As her other books are translated, she makes changes, and then she goes back to him every time and saying that she wants to make changes to the original Spanish. You know, but he says, oh, "Let me think about it for a minute." Um, no, <laughs> but but so um, we went through. And, and then she wanted, she didn't want me to work directly with Christina. I mean, I could talk to her, it wasn't like a gag order, but she wanted our relationship to be the relationship and then she would work very closely with Christina and they would talk about my suggestions and her suggestions and then Christina would enter the changes and send me the text back. Um, so there was quite a lot of restructuring that went on between the Spanish edition and the um, US edition. I mean, I personally, so, my experience and my own kind of theory and thoughts about translation is that as long as the author and translator are okay with it, like I would prefer to make as many suggestions as I feel if I want to, as if it was just an original English English text, and let them sort it out. Um, I mean, they can come back to me with questions and stuff, but it's like that's just how I prefer to work, I think. And so I would actually look for more projects where that would be the case, um, and. So probably not doing any dead authors. Probably, well, probably not. I mean, unless I really like it, but in yeah. which case, like, yeah, then I, it would be, I would have to just accept it. But that's what I was going to say. So if it's a dead author, do you feel like that, that's that then if the right. author can't be involved, the changes shouldn't be as dr drastic? For sure. I, that's what I think. And that's when we sort of um, 
reanimate the issue of the author and authority and where we're getting our authority to make changes, right? Yeah. And so even the, the most um, liberal-minded of us as translators who think that we're not kowtowing to that kind of authority, when we start thinking about the difference between working with living writers and, and dead ones, realize that most of us probably, without like significant framing and prefaces to show that we're doing a thing, like with the discussion of mistakes and Baudelaire's, which um, is interesting because um, I was also just publishing a bunch of divergent Baudelaire's. I feel like we're all beating up on Baudelaire. Um, but um, that- uh, It's okay. No, he can take it. But that's the point, right? He can take it. And, and since we're working with this author and you're working with your author, it gives us all this liberty that they're bestowing this liberty on us, which is a little problematic and complicated. <coughs> I think Chris brings up a really important point, too, about our English language editorial culture. And this is something I've heard from, you know, a lot of Latin American writers, that they don't have the same culture of editorial feedback and dialogue that we do. And oftentimes, they're very happy to receive it at the stage of their book being translated into English and are, you know, can be remarkably receptive to some pretty significant changes in the original text. That's pretty true. I think Danny Han was saying something about Valeria writing a story right now in which Christina's, the, the, neither version exists, that somehow they're, am I getting that right? Danny, are you in here? Yeah, is that right? You're saying something, the fact that she was writing it in Spanish and working with Christina on the English translation essentially simultaneously, so to get feedback to make the Spanish, to write the Spanish as it's being translated into English, right? Yeah, I also, I also, it's not completely a meta thing. I also edit the Spanish when she finishes writing Pablo Dom in the translation. Right. And she says basically, well, the original won't really exist until Christina finishes writing it. They could, have, they could have rewritten themselves, but the Spanish, I should say, um, is, is kind of contingent somehow on the process of working with Christina. Which just says, like, uh, um, as a, a teaser, I suppose, if you don't know, Valeria Luiselli will be here this afternoon and tonight at the closing reception, um, and we'll talk about these sort of processes and like how, how her book came into being. Tell us about the blue pamphlet. Well, so before the blue one, so the, okay. there, the, uh, Christina, when she worked on the book, um, created an extremely elaborate chronology that um, had all of the, what happened in the book and then different th historical things that happened and references that were over and above what was in the text originally. So it's its, its own creative piece. Um, and Valeria loved it so much, and I loved it, and we were trying to figure out what to do with it. And in the end, like I don't remember who suggested it was my suggestion or Valeria's, but it was her call in the end. We incorporated that as part of the text. So that is the final book of the text, and it's not an appendix. It's like book uh, six, six or seven. seven. Yeah, so it's, that, it's the, uh, the, the chronologic is what it's called. So that is another way that she's bringing in and kind of messing, blurring the lines between author and translator. And so then, um, as part of our editorial process, I asked a intern who had studied translation um, in London uh, to do a, a fact check on the book. And knowing very well also that there's a lot of facts and facts and it yeah. didn't really matter. <laughs> but she wrote you know, a like, 30 page Excel spreadsheet that was massively elaborate and she really had fun with it. And you know, it has things like, you know, uh, can macaws suffer from sadness? Yes. And then she lists the source. Can you press a can you press a corner of your nail between your upper and lower central incisors? Yes. You know, is it always raining in Pachuca? Yes. So it's, <laughs> it's all this stuff, and she'll have and she just kind of commentary on it too. And so we created this 67 page oh fact check, kind of as an extension yeah. of the book, and I we call it, it book eight. Um, and it wasn't this. It's not. So what this book is. Uh -huh in the world is a little mysterious. Like, is it, is it a marketing tool? I mean, Valeria authorized this also. And so that's the thing. She said, no, do it, please. Let's send it out. Like, do whatever you want with it. Um, and so now, Valeria, actually, we've been talking about whether or not we will insert this into a future edition of the book at the end, and then how we frame that or whether or not we frame it. I mean, certainly the intern will get credit. Her name was Aoife Roberts, by the way. So she's great. Um, and she and we paid her for this and all that. So it's uh, so it's not just intern 
Labor. <laughs> yeah, so that's the, the fact check. And we printed about 500 of these, sent them out with reviewers, and just kind of distributed them. Gave them away at a PEA, too. That's right, for side, yeah. Right. And yeah. so people have been writing about this in some of the reviews that's come mm -hmm. up in the chronologic. And so they've said, oh, this should be really posted. It should exist in the world. And so we're trying to figure out what to do with that. And so that, much to the kind of possible chagrin to other international publishers and Eduardo at Sexto Piso to see what will happen with the book. So, so we'll come back to all of these things, but um, we'll have involve you now, Kaya, in that, and I will frame this by saying that um, <coughs> your JT Mahaney, who translates Antoine Volodine, was supposed to be on the panel with us this morning, but he accidentally scheduled his flight for Saturday morning instead of Sunday morning, so he is not here at all. However, JT worked on, um, I, just, I don't know how many people know who Antoine Volodine is. Volodine is a French writer um, that writes under a series of pseudonyms. Antoine Volodine is the most popular of those pseudonyms. It's not even his real name. I don't know what his name is. I, don't, I think it exists, but I, that you could find it. It's not like super hidden, but it's hidden enough. Um, and he writes under Antoine Volodine, Manuela Drager, and Lutz Bassman. And he's created, he's published, I believe, 42 books now under these three pseudonyms. Yes, exactly 42. Um, and they're all set within this sort of disjointed common world in which um, there has, it's, set, it's kind of futuristic, there's some sort of like apocalyptic thing has happened, um, and that there used to be this group of writers that wrote as post-exoticists. In the post-exoticist movement, these writers use these certain um, terms, these certain ways of structuring their story, and all these invented mythologies to like upend capitalism, was their, their main point. So they were jailed and killed and destroyed, and this is like the world that it exists in. In his books, all of these characters recur. Like Lutz Bassman narrates um, one of the books that we published by this written by Antoine Bolodin that includes a description of one of Bolodin's other books that has nothing to do with uh, Bolodin's other book. So all these people are like the same and different at the same time. So JT worked on these, and I think you were going to talk about JT's approach and your approach to working with him on editing Bolodin, right? I guess for my, my theory on JT's okay. approach, and because he's not here, he can't really say that I'm wrong. And I sort of I sort of spoke to him for a minute about it last night, and um, sometimes JT has this affect where you're not really sure if he agrees with you or disagrees with you, because he just kind of stares at you blankly. And so <laughs> I'm still not sure if I'm in any way close to my theory of his process on this. Um, and I'll try to make this tie-in as much as possible because I was very excited about this last night for about five minutes and then found out he wouldn't be here and then everything came crashing down, so I sort of lost my steam on it. Um, <clears throat> but so the second, uh, JT has translated two Volodin books for us. The first was Post-Exoticism in 10 Lessons, Lesson 11, which was his thesis project as a graduate student at the University of Rochester. And the second book is one that's forthcoming. It's called, Bar it's called Bardo or Not Bardo. Um, and uh, to go sort of in the vein of these translations that come in and are incredibly clean, um, JT is also a person who, when he translates, I think that his work is very clean. And I think he, he spends, um, I mean, as, as I think many of us as translators do, you spend a lot of time working on this. but. Um, one thing I was trying to sort of solidify in my mind as a potential process of his is that um, when the finished manuscript for the second Volodine book, Bardo or Not Bardo, came to me, it seemed to be at the same stage as what the first book, the post-exoticism in 10 lessons was after he had worked on it extensively with Chad as his advisor, you, you were the advisor or just his like portfolio advisor? Uh, something. Um, but they, uh, on a weekly basis, if not a couple times a week, met and talked about his process and his translation. Um, in my memory, it was very extensive because I feel like JT was always in our office either googling <laughs> cemeteries or talking to Chad about this book. Um, and so, my, my theory, and I think it, it sort of makes sense, it's, it's less of a, like a crazy theory as it makes sense where his experience with working on Chad with that first book as his thesis project carried over into his next translation of Volodine. So all of that was built into his translation process already. So um, that's, that's sort of my theory that he, he absorbed very much what he learned in working with Chad as an editor and applied that to his next translation. And I think to the point where it was, it seemed like he had spent a year and a half working on it in a sort of academic setting, um, which maybe sounds bad. But what I wanted to tie in with that is that um, 
I had the the great opportunity to go to the Sizopol fiction seminars in Bulgaria this summer, which everyone should apply for or find some way to get involved in because it's a really great experience. Um, and most of the panels that they had were about editing and editing translations because Bulgaria, like many countries, doesn't really have editors that actively work on the, the books that go to be published. Yeah. Um, and one of the women who spoke was a translator who had worked on a project with us. Um, her name is Olga Nikolova. And one thing, she wrote me an email to apologize about this later because it made me sound like a monster, sort of. But um, she had been in Rochester for three months, a couple of years before we started working on the book of the, her translation that we then published. Um, which meant that she spent three weeks workshopping her translation with us. And then a couple years went by and she submitted it for a Bulgarian literature contest that we have and her book ended up being chosen. Um, and the, the quality of the translation from when she had workshopped it with us to when she submitted it as something that we would publish was vastly improved. I, and you know, I, I was very surprised and then in Bulgaria, she was saying that as she was translating the book, she was imagining the workshops that we had had in Rochester and anticipating my commentary. And it didn't, I mean, and you know, we crack jokes in our workshop and we say things. So she basically imagined me like perched on her shoulder, making sort of sarcastic or catty comments about certain phrasings, which I don't really remember doing in Rochester. <laughs> but the point being that I, what I want to try to connect that I sort of believe JT did after working with you, Chad, was similar to what Olga experienced, is that she, um, you know, when people talk about the translator being the first editor for the text, I think there's another level where she was anticipating what I as an editor would say as she was working. So she'd type out a sentence and look at it and go, I know what Kai is going to say about this sentence, and I don't really like that, so I'm going to change it and rework it until she anticipates that my reaction would be not that and something that would be more favorable to, to her mind. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I guess it worked because the translation was really great and there were some parts that we had to work on. Um, so I think JT did a similar thing, and I really, there wasn't a lot of content editing. There were some questions that we had. Um, about certain phrases or certain terminology that, um, I mean, I've, I've read a few of the other Voladin books that are in English and we wanted to make sure that those concepts or ide ideas were connected across the Voladin canon. Um, but other than that, I think that his experience working with you carried over to the point where I basically had to spell check and circle a few things, ask him questions. I always, and Heather knows this as well, I very much enjoy having a conversation with our translators as a translator myself, I want to ask those questions, understand if something seems funny to me, I'll highlight it, and if the translator explains it and I'm okay with it, and then I get it and it's fine, then we'll keep it, and I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> I just want to ask what, how you felt about that um, as an editor. I mean, the fact that she had internalized you as her reader, right? Yeah. In this really profound way. And if he, you said you felt like it, what she then produced was something that was much closer to being ready for publication. Yes. And so uh, it's a lot of responsibility. And like. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess to be fair, and it, it's a fair point to her, she's, um, she's a very cynical person with a very dry sense of humor. So the way she presented this sort of revelation made me sound like a, like a horrible person. Um, but she, and like I said, she wrote to me later to apologize for how it may have sounded, but she said it really, she valued that as her internalized experience because um, it, it really did change the way that she approached her own work. And I mean, in, in our case, it helped because she had spent time with us and she knew us um, as opposed to, you know, other, other translators of ours who may not know us personally. Um, and similarly with JT, he had lived in Rochester for two years and so he kind of, it's possible, and so that's what I'm trying to connect, that he may be able to, he may have that luxury of anticipating what our editorial reactions will be, and also he knows that we have read other works of Voladin, so maybe that changes the reception, well, it definitely changes the reception in that sense. Something um, <clears throat> that's sort of coming clear here, or to tie those together as like a sort of theme, is that there's a lot of times that we have these sort of panels and there's a lot of people that are translators who are like, editors are awful, because editors are trying to change things and make them more American or make them more 
uh, palatable to like an imaginary reading public. And what you guys all seem to be saying, and especially with you and Mario Beatin as well, because um, you translate all of his books that you published, right? No. No, but some of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is that there's, there's the idea of developing a relationship between the editor and the translator and that that relationship continues on um, and uh, influences how the translation is being written and what, what, what the barriers are. That it's not just a book comes in, hack it all out, and then send it off, but that there is some more interaction that way or more of like a, a life, or like a, not a lifetime relationship, but like a, like a, a relationship of sorts that goes on. And that, the reason that that comes to mind is that um, I was on a panel with Jill Schoolman from Archipelago, and when she talked about how she likes to find translators to work with and work with them several times if they like that experience. And that is that in some ways it was like complementary to the idea of finding an author they're going to do several books by. She wanted to find a translator that she would do several books with. And that they, if they liked that experience, it became easier and it influenced the, the, the writing style. Um, yeah. Well, and just to say, I don't know, I've only worked with a handful of publishers, but um, even with the, the most commercial of the fiction that I edit, um, a lot of which is translated, I have been really delighted to find that the translators um, are thrilled to be getting the feedback. And even, again, even though it's, it's pretty commercial stuff mostly, um, there has been lots of space for a relationship and for the translators to come back to me as the editor and explain why they're doing things or to say that's a per I didn't want to, I wasn't the editor so I didn't want to go there, I'm so glad you did or can we talk about this? Yeah. And so that makes me hope that, right, that makes me hope that at um, a press that's smaller or more literary minded or things that, and less commercial, that there's even more space for that or that this is the norm. I had been assuming that to some extent it's now the norm to have that relationship. That's actually a question I have about okay. that. I've had translators be very, very involved with that, um, uh, involved in being the liaison to the author, making the strong suggestions, proposing their own, what the scene could look like if we're adding a scene, and taking that to the author and getting yes or no, or, or just you know, interpreting back and forth. But I, I don't know the norms. Um, I only know, you know I, but I've seen a, a wide range within what I've done, and maybe the, the publishers here can tell us what you know, their, their norms are. We've got a few. Um, but I think it depends entirely on the translator. And part of what you said that's interesting to me as a person who's an editor and a translator is how much editing we do, especially when it's commercial, we're thinking about American audiences more than we might for poetry or for something, right? Um, how, how much we edit, we see ourselves as, as sort of doing a light edit in our translation, right? You were saying like you see things you want tightened up and how much we do that.
Um, I was gonna say, I was gonna say two things. One that's to be slightly less relevant, but that might circle around. That seems to be my theme today. Is that one thing to consider when when an editor is reading something is that an editor is also a reader, and every reader is gonna perceive a book differently. Um, so something that I may want to cut, David may not want to cut, and <coughs> Anna might not want to cut, and Chris might say, well, yeah, you're right, but I would only cut half of it. Um, and the other thing in terms of communication, there, and I will use Volodine as an example, I've never had an exchange with Volodine. I don't think you have, like Volodine, if you are, you can only talk to Volodine if you are his translator or his publisher. Um, I've had other authors where I've, I've emailed with the agents or the publisher and sort of tried to poke at it because sometimes you know the, the authors who do have a good command of the English language do want to be more involved. It's easier for me to just email them directly. But I've had situations where I've sort of hinted at it to the publisher or the agent that that might be helpful for a translator. And they'll say, oh, just send us the translator's email and the author will get in touch with them. So there are those authors who prefer to interact with their translators. And I think for the most part, and in the last couple years that I can actually think of, Anytime I've had a question about something, either about content or about um, just an explanation of whatever, I'll ask the translator, especially if the author, if I can't talk to the author myself as the editor or if the author's English is not that great, I'll just write the translator and say, I don't really understand this and you know, was this intentional, was that intentional? And then the translator will say, well, I don't know, like there was something for the Bardo book where I had a, I had a question about um, a specific term, and JT just said, well, I'll, I'll shoot an email to Volodine and I'll let you know what he says, and that's that's what it was. So frequently for us, the translator is that middleman. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, so I don't know, I mean, that's, that's... It does seem to come down to a question that you brought up of authority and who makes the final decisions, um, <clears throat> which is something I'm curious how you guys react to. I know at least one person in the audience has had experience with a different publisher in which the publisher and the editor makes all the final decisions and they don't care if the translator disagrees with them. That's the problem. Well, but the translator, <laughs> the translator really should, I mean, when I, when I edit and send things back to a translator, I really, they're still the translator, they're still the person who understands both halves of the equation better than anyone else involved. And I still want them coming back and saying, well, I, you know, I see why you tightened that up, but here's why in the finish, it, you know, we really need to, the author feels strongly, or I feel strongly, or you don't understand the, you know, what finish is doing. And I want to hear that because as an editor, I'm just one reader. Yeah. And so I'm going to run roughshod, especially, you know, commercial fiction, I'm thinking about popular audience. I'm going to run roughshod only with the understanding, and I, you know, say this to them a lot, that the, the translator is going to push back because I don't have any of that context that they have and hopefully lots of publishers and editors are asking for that and making that space for that because the, you have to still be in the middle of it. You're still the translator. Chris, how do you, you don't, you don't read Spanish, right? Or you do? No. Not, not, do you, not well enough. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, I guess we represent that, that you guys all translate and edit. Mm -hmm. Whereas we don't, so we're sort of. Do you feel that there's a difference there? Would you do you feel like you're you give yourself more leeway because you're reading it only as an English book versus reading it and seeing, knowing what the Spanish would be or whatever language it might be? How, how does that impact you, or do you think about that, or? Um, I let that the, I let the translator mediate between the author and I'll I'll do my reaction mm -hmm. as if it didn't exist in Spanish right. in the first place, and then let assuming that Christina or whoever I'm working with uh -huh. will then have the conversation with Valeria and loop me back in if necessary. And that the author, and then they will come to an agreement. Like I'm actually the least important person <laughs> about this final decision in that case. Mm -hmm. Like okay. after I've made a suggestion. How do you guys feel yeah. as, as being translators and editing? Do you, do you, does that, how does that impact you? I guess like, does it, does it, I would imagine that it gives you a wider breadth in understanding what the translator's role is and how the translator can act within this, but at the same time, there seems to be the temptation to like be almost, I could see someone making the argument that you'd be more forgiving of the translator and not just solely as like the English reading audience. But I don't know, how do you deal with that? Or how do you, do you, do you have two different mindsets when you go into translating something versus editing it? Or how do you manage that? I don't know if I have two different mindsets. I mean, I think they're, they're, yeah, they're a little bit different. But um, I think probably like, like Anna, when I'm editing, you know, I really value the translator's insight and assume that that they have more knowledge or expertise than I do uh, 
in regards to the text. Uh, and I think, you know, our editorial process is a very collaborative, very, um, you know, conversational approach. Um, I, I have this theory that, uh, that Chad is actually the ghost translator of all of Open Letters books. So it's <laughs> funny to hear you say that. I've been, uh, I've been looking for a ghost translator myself. <laughs> Too many projects. Maybe um, one way to answer that is to say that being a translator makes, and I don't, I don't know how to separate myself from being a translator, so I don't know if this is really helpful, but that, um, that I feel very protective of the translator and their role, and to me the, um, the translator, as much as possible, has the final say, and all of the editing is largely suggestion, unless there's major problems that the publisher's involved in, but that the translator is doing whatever negotiations they need to do, and that it's, it's their call, ultimately. Um, and, and that might come in part from being a translator and you know, having that translator chip on my shoulder, knowing how, how much it, more in the middle of it they are than the publisher or the editor ever could be. And yeah. I feel like we have, we have one weird situation right now that will uh, maybe add something to this, and I want to open this up to questions, too. But our most recent um, book of Merce Rotorita is a Catalan author, died in 1983, I believe. Um, she's incredibly famous. We've done a number of her books, and they've, they're very successful. She's one of our best-selling authors and most, most well-loved. And her new book, War So Much War, um, was translated by a mother and daughter team. And they're going to be writing about this for Lit Hub, so there'll be more information about this later. But uh, they've said it several times in emails, even as recently as yesterday, about how they spruced up the original because the, it wasn't Marisa Rodoreda's best written book, and that they it, it made it more like her other books and fixed things. I have not a fucking clue as to what they changed in that, <laughs> and have never asked, and didn't care, and just let it go. It could be, I don't know what, what, how much liberty they took, um, but it, it's sort of related to what you're saying, of like, it, the book reads incredibly well, it's in Harper's this month, everyone who's read it loves it, That's it's gorgeous. fantastic. <laughs> And where those, where that, what the original, what the, where that was, is a complete mystery to me, and I have no idea. Hmm. Well, I don't. I also, I don't speak Catalan either, so I don't know the extent. But we were in, in conversations. They did also an email saying multiple times how much work they put into it, and we, to a point where we were joking. Um, there was one sentence they had in one of their emails that I said that we should just scratch everything else and make that the main blurb, which, which was we wanted to kill ourselves and then just like the translators, and that's the blurb on the cover of the book because <laughs> they, they just, that's how much they put into it. And they sent that note to me before I started reading it. And so when I started reading it, I had a similar reaction, I think, where I, I almost didn't care to what extent because knowing, knowing Rotorata's work and knowing that they know Rotorata's work, it's, it's a beautiful translation and I think the book is, it's one of the best things I've read and I don't remember if it was, if we got it last year, so I think I already put it on my like top whatever for 2015, but they've done a magnificent job and in that case you're talking about trusting the translator, this is an author that um, Martha Tennant, who is one of the two, has worked with for years, and so I trusted her implicitly because she knows Rodriguez's work, and she, she's a, also a very talented translator. Um, and yeah, I mean, there and to sort of piggyback back a little bit to something David said earlier about, you know, with having a question, and if the translator can explain the choice, um, and why you as the editor should not change it or why you should keep it, that's something that came up in in that book with them as well with. And, and I think it's not, a, it's not a bad practice just to say, you know, as an editor, I would change this, but I, I do frequently say, but I could be convinced to keep it if you explain to me why you want to keep it. And sometimes it's a silly explanation, and I don't agree, but for most of the time, and like with Martha and, and her daughter and um, Marusha, they would explain why they made a certain decision, and both as an editor, as a translator, I appreciated that explanation and knowing, and. And it's a different panel, I guess, but that's a that's a case where as a reader I would be interested in a preface like explaining what, you know, why it was so far from the source material, what was going on in the source material that made it so different from other books or what their thinking was in yeah. as a publisher I don't want that. Because <laughs> I know that that will scare off the general An reader. After 
<laughs> they can put that on a and in a like translation like they, can translation, they can publish that <laughs> elsewhere. I don't want I don't want that. I don't want the reaction of the person picking up and being like, oh, this isn't the real and thing. I, I feel like I feel <coughs> like their their fact check book would just be an itemized list of all the wine they drank while they translated it. <laughs> so. They said that for this article they're writing, it's going to be a conversation because they got in a lot of fights as a mother and daughter and working on this. So yeah, it should be pretty fun. Okay. Right, it's very true too. Heather, you said you had a question for us. Yeah, before I asked it. Oh. It was, uh, it was the ways in which um, three of you are both considered editors. Or, and, and I love the, the anecdote about the internalized voice, right? Um, and I was wondering as you're editing translations, does your, I mean, you all have these voices, right? Do you, does your internal translator, not in terms of, um, you know, translators' rights and the right to be consulted and the right to have, but more like, <laughs> a lot, I, and I, I think that that's what makes me good at um, editing translated fiction in particular. I mean, do other fiction books, but, but I understand what the translator's doing sometimes. I understand what the, and I mostly do things that aren't from languages I have access to, but I still frequently understand what the original must have been doing, right, if it's not always the best translator, right, but, and um, know the kind of feedback to give and what they're going to take on Bridget and. Um, but yeah, I don't think you can turn that off. And in the other direction, I worry about, and less in poetry because I'm more, more in the level of the words in this kind of poetry, but um, in other poetry less, but it, I, not being always sure about turning off the editor when translating. Like I, um, Maria Jose Jimenez, who's also here, um, not in the room, and I uh, were just doing a sample for a book we were bidding on and we're, we're also, both editors and translators, and we were having a hard time, and ended up giving something that was sort of lightly, uh, you know, content edited, um, and they they were happy about it. But that's not what the role necessarily was, and so that's a conversation you'd have to have with a publisher. But I don't I don't know about you guys. I can't turn one off. They feel because whenever we're translating, we're editing, right? There's no we try to be pure, there's no pure. I don't believe in pure. So the more you're doing both, I think the more they're overlapping. Yeah, no, I agree. I think you know. That I definitely give the types of comments I would hope to receive. At the same time, you know, I've Phoneme has published uh, translations of authors that I've translated myself. I'm saying by other translators, and I feel like their translations of the same author's work are fairly different than my translation would have been. But at the same time, you know, it's it's negotiating that balance. I think that's fine, and actually, I think that's really fascinating, yeah. and uh, part of part of what I like about it. You know, kind of like the uh, the uh, Le Spectre books that New Directions has done, right? Um, which have you know a half dozen translators. Yeah, um, that's that's really fascinating to me, and so it was important for me in editing that book to to give the kind of feedback that I would want, but not to impose my own vision of, of the author's work. And that is a fine line, I think, <clears throat> for editing of like imposing your, how you want it to read, um, is something that you could fall into a habit of. I know, I know people have done that, where they are essentially reworking the book to be a book that, how they would have liked it to have been written, more so than how it existed. I think what Ben did with those, um, Ben Moser, that edited the, the four novels, the Little Spectre novels, was, was really challenging and really interesting, because they're coming in at the same time, and going through and trying to make sure that they have a coherence in the voice, and in terms of like when certain particular words were used, how they were being reflected in the other books, which is crazy to, to think about, like really crazy to think about. Um, other questions, yeah. Before they've been edited, is that the idea that they would be different in the published well, edition? Be different, be different. Is that okay? I don't well, have a problem with that. 
I, I don't think there's a there's not a problem. We had one collection of short stories that actually I think every story but one had been excerpted in journals okay. um, before we had published it. But right. at the end of the day, and that was a discussion we had with the translator was that um, or one of the one of the discussions we had with the translator was that yes, we understand that those stories have been published in other journals, but we are now publishing them as a collection by open letters. So we were going to edit that collection as a full collection that right. we as open letter were going to publish. So there were going to be differences. And again, different readers, mm -hmm. different editors, but it wasn't it wasn't a problem. It was actually sort of sweet because it already had the promotion right. <laughs> and the <laughs> excerpts that preceded it. So. What if it had been a novel with random chapters here and there? Would that have been the same? I think it's always fine because I mean, most of those things fine. are like are, are truly like marketing and getting right. people people aware of it. Right. Um, like you could, in theory, with that book, with uh, it's, uh, Liz Harris's translation of "This Is the Garden," which was one of the finalists for the NTA or was long listed for the NTA, yeah. I forget. And um, <clears throat> but you're not gonna—I don't think a reader is gonna figure that out and then go buy all the journals or all the pieces and, and avoid buying our book just because of the sake of convenience. So it's more of like an entryway. Like if they see a chapter somewhere yeah. and think this sounds kind of interesting. Then they can go find the full book. I think that it's it, it's helpful. Publishers usually experience. want that. Yeah, right? we definitely always. Yeah, the more the the more the merrier for the most part. Um, and there's other stories of. Uh, leave us one chapter, you know. Yeah, <laughs> leave us one, one little one moment. <laughs> yeah. the, I remember a story that Marion Schwartz told about um, translating Nina Berberova and how she had. Uh, there's this is I don't know if anyone here translates Russian, but there's lots of always issues with uh, agents and things, like this comes up a lot in relation to Russian literature, and I think she had sold um, the rights to a short story that Marion was translated, and then sold the same short story to another translator to put in like, um, I think it was in the New Yorker, in fact, and she's like, isn't this great? And Marion's like, no, this is horrible. Like, now we have two different people working on the same thing at the same time, and they're like, oh no, but the more the merrier. That would be a problem. Um, but otherwise, I don't think that is that much of an issue. Yeah. use a pseudonym and pretend it's one person. <laughs> that would, that's, that's just one joke. I think you had something you wanted to say about this. Well, actually. I literally met with them right before this panel, so. <laughs> well, tell, tell us what your idea was. Well, first. my idea was just the 3% the the thing or the cover letter thing I, or just in general. Just in general. What I talked about. Yeah. Well, so uh, I, I spoke with you just before the panel, this group of students, and the idea that we sort of had was uh, similar to something that a former student of Chad's did in... Um, I don't remember which, I think she was only finding Argentinian and Chilean authors and she wanted to find more South American yeah. um, authors to create a portfolio from. And so she basically did sort of an open call for suggestions on the 3% website and um, got a very good response from what I remember from other translators. Um, and that was something that we had been talking about with, with this group of students was the possibility of just sort of giving them a platform to sort of explain what their project is in a little more detail, why the author wanted to have all five of them working on this, um, and also just sort of do a similar open call for, for suggestions if anyone, whatever they choose, if anyone else has been in a similar project and what their experience was, or if anyone has any suggestions of how to present it. Um, my, my first initial reaction was, oh my god, five people, that makes me scared as an editor. Um, but another suggestion was that you can take that fact and put a very positive spin on it when presenting the project to publishers. Why is it integral that there, why is it important that there are five people working on it? Why is it important to the author? What does it add to the project? Why does it, don't make it scary, make it a happy thing. And, and in terms of the fear factor, um, on a practical note too, 
designate someone who That's would it. be working yeah. with the editor yeah. because an editor does not want to work with that. <laughs> no, it's terrible. No, yeah, it's just logistically, it uh, yeah. can be a mess. But yeah, if there's a point person that would make that would sort cares? of relieve some of those yeah. those issues. And you could still anything the editor said to that point person could be consulted with the other translators. Yeah. But so that the editor's not emailing five people and getting five different responses um, to attract changes, that would that would be terrifying. That's the moment when you're just like, oh, no, I don't want to. Do <laughs> yeah, that, no. but. I'm not oh. sure if I, in terms of uh, submitting it to a publisher, like, um, to see if they're interested? Uh, I mean, yeah, or an editor or something like that. Like, the, in terms of the quality or the, the, the yeah, I don't know. We, we, we want it to be, um, huh, okay, so there's, there's two different ways to answer this. Let me, let me see if this, this maybe makes sense. If you're doing a whole book and the whole book is you're going to do before you submit it to anyone, then that is, good and as, and as finished a form as possible as you can make it is perfect. If you're going to try and find a publisher or editor before you're done with the project, then you can make it clear that it is a first draft. I mean, with, uh, with um, uh, Guillermo Sacamano, what we got from you was the beginning, like the first 50 pages of the 750 page book, um, which is amazing, but it's 750 pages. So knowing the first 50 pages, we made a decision that we wanted to publish it based on that knowing that you're probably going to edit and change, that it wasn't a finished product at a moment in time. So if you're doing it under the, and saying this is sample, this is the first draft, this is to get you interested and in to see if you want to publish it, that can be fine. If it's something where you're like, we're doing this whole book and now we're going to find someone, I think that that, I would expect something a little bit more polished and done. And I know having done, um a translation MFA and and you know various degrees and things like it, that it's a collaborative project and you're doing the whole thing as a group as part of your program and so I understand why you're doing the whole thing but also as someone who did a handful of novels at various points that then the agents changed and they wanted to bring in a different translator and like don't after this project or in general maybe make a habit of doing sample doing chapters and samples and finding a publisher first because I think a lot of us make that mistake early on that we just we get excited about a novel and we do it or something you know long and we do it and then find out the rights aren't available or you know whatever the case may be <laughs> right um, so as a like a learning project th this sounds great but publishers are going to be interested in a sample mostly they're not yeah. going to say you have to have the whole thing finished before we yeah publish. that's true for you guys too right Chris you you prefer because yes. you're starting to do more and more Spanish language literature. Yeah, I mean, I think that mostly right now, I'm more of contact with publishers mm -hmm. than with translators in the first place. Yeah. And okay. so, um, I mean, well, now it's I mean, Valeria's multiple books, but I think since then, it's I've been working through or agents, you know, contacting me about brand new books, and so that's then I have someone read it or do, you know, they might do a sample. Right. Or, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's uh, if I was going to do it the other way, yeah, just, I would let a sample and a synopsis for sure, and to know the rights. Right. Yeah, yeah that, sure. that's important. That's <clears throat> a very important yeah. part. Yeah. <laughs> Should I keep everyone's gonna have nightmares? Hey, it's Halloween. Um, I don't I mean that's. I don't know that there's ever been. I don't know that there's ever been an actual situation in one of the books that I've edited where there's been a problem with voice. There may be once in a while. Um, once in a while, a situation where you can tell from 
the way the like a chapter or a section is paced that the translator was maybe rushing to do something and they didn't quite spend as much time but those are generally I feel pretty easy to identify and then I just highlight it and say like something sounds a little off or it sounds like you rushed this could you look at it and rework it and generally that's that's that works perfectly and the translator will look at it and go back and do what they need to do um, and then it's, it's exactly what I would have wanted it to be. Um, but that's something we talk about in our workshops very frequently, especially in terms of the most, the, the most common issue is with dialogue in terms of tonality and register. Um, and those are things that we discuss very often in the workshops we do at Rochester, um, where you can sort of, I guess, I guess there's kind of a feeling, I don't know how, how you guys, everyone else feels in terms of that, but I, I think there's a feeling when you're reading it, you can, you, you can sense that it's it's a little off or something's missing, and sometimes it's as simple as just saying, consider introducing contractions, um, consider what the register of the character is in the original, um, because right now your character sounds like an academic, but it's a 13-year-old girl. So just things like that, and I mean. And and I think that there's two, two ways that happens, that happens in a, an editorial letter. Uh, or that happens in the in the margins, and it, and I and it just has everything to do with what the project is and who the publisher is. And I mean, I do heavy revising of like I just put in the contractions if it's the kind of commercial project where I'm just supposed to. The translator has mostly done their work; is mostly you know not looking for lots more hours. You know, to keep their hourly respectable at all. They're not. They don't. You know, and it's my job as the developmental person to do that, mm -hmm. and then to listen if they say no. Really, there's a reason, and I'll take it out every time, right? But um, to actually be looking at the fact that these are teenage characters and they don't use that diction, right? And somehow that was missed. And I'll ask a translator, "Is this something you've really done intentionally?" And unless they have, I'll just rewrite it. So, yeah. but that again is, you know, are you doing commercial work? Are you doing? Yeah, and sometimes there's actually a case with. Um, a, a book that we've been working on, not as a print version, but as an e-version. This is the um, Rosa book, where the translator was a former student, and the initial the initial translation that he was doing was in one register, and then one of his professors had had him writing a lot of essays on a weekly basis, so by the time he had written academic essays every single week, and he started re-looking at the translation, it was a different product, and you could tell that he hadn't really made a shift from his academic essay voice to his book and so we were like you don't talk like this on a regular basis like this isn't you know this yeah. is wildly different from the first draft that we saw because the register had this sort of feel to it where I don't know I, mean, I think that it's largely with the wish and editorial voice thing um, I mean it's all about its consent essentially I mean that's what consent <coughs> and um, but you have there's different ways of going about editing so, so for me my former boss Alan Cornbull who died last year um, was authoritative and intrusive um, but he but he would say always like it's your book you know I think but you know but that's that's a little bit I take it I took a step back where I don't I'm not authoritative at all like it's more like I constantly am backing up like this is your call or like consider you know, consider contract contractions, and I think that's the way that I talk to our editors on staff. Like that's how I want you to be, because I don't want an author to ever feel like pushed around or that they're being bullied into something, because that's not that's not the role of the editor. <clears throat> um, but I think that there there can be a relationship between an author and editor um, where an author can, and I know this is a little bit different with translation, but like can invite someone to be as intrusive as they want to be. I mean, this is a tiny bit different, but like there's uh, another person on my staff um, who is a very good writer um, and has a different approach to a lot of things than I do. Um, and she is an extremely good editor of me, and I let her do anything she wants to my text because it's like I know that she's making it better. And it's like, but she doesn't ever have to say, oh, Chris, do you think we could change this? She's just like, jerk change it <coughs> you know I don't know that's I think there's um, there's a there's a great book called the, the the delighted states by Adam Thurwell in which he talks a lot about translation practices in the old like um, you know retaining staying close to the original versus like making more American blah 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 and how you, you judge all that and the thing that comes out of that book the most I think is 
is really useful in approaching what you're talking about, is the idea that the thing that gets conveyed in translation is the style, is the original style of that book. And whatever style might mean becomes a little bit cryptic and a little bit slippery. Like, it's the, the type of the word choices, it's the structure, it's the all the parts that make that book a unique and important book. And I think for anyone that's doing, I mean, for any publisher, you, the books that you're choosing are ones that you think have something unique and special and amazing about them. And with translation, this becomes almost doubly so, that you know that the book itself is amazing and has something unique and a style that you want then to make available to English readers, and the translation has to sort of do that too. So in forms of like uh, being intrusive, I think the, the, the layer that I want to be intrusive to a text I'm editing is to get that style right. And that it's not, the it's not the same between different books. Each book has its own particular uniqueness and voice and the reason that I'm, that I'm attracted to it, and to make sure that that's working as to the best that it can. So rather than like imposing myself, letting, making sure that book is getting out there. And that as a translator, like when we do the workshops and working with students is like, a lot of people here are very um, experienced and have, and, and have gone beyond this, but working with students at the beginning of their, their term translating, a lot of times it's like uh, encountering texts where it's like, yes, your translation is conveying the meaning. You've got the meaning, you know the words, you understand what the words in Spanish mean and what the words in English mean, and they're equivalent, so to speak, but there's no, there's no spark there. You're missing the, what, the, what is important about the book and trying to get them to feel free enough that they're not just like trying to kind of rote translate, but to feel the book and to be creating that book is something that I think is really important. I think it revolves, the way that I always talk about it at times is trying to revolve it around the style and figuring out what it is, that, that, how that book functions as a reader and how you can then, as a translator slash writer, make that function as well, if that makes sense. So for Valeria, for instance, mm -hmm. um, her translator is English. Uh, she lives in England. And, but Valeria likes to talk a lot about the difference between um, official publishing Spanish in Spain versus Latin American Spanish or Mexican Spanish. And so she wants to highlight that. So Christina is translating. She's doing another step where she's translating and she's trying to make an American sounding English. Yeah. And she does very good, but that's the other thing. Then I'm, then I'm interacting with Christina's version of what she thinks an American versus English is. is. So. <laughs> very complicated. I think we have time for like one more question. I'd like to add something yeah. to uh, Jeff's question about that uh, relationship between the editor and translator, which is just to say there I've definitely had experiences and I welcome them when a translator wants more feedback. You know, I'm I'm willing to uh, to give that feedback. I, you know, certainly am no lish on anyone's shoulder. But uh, but I think if that's something you're looking for as a translator, most editors are going to be receptive to that. And I think people have, well, I imagine that translators also have a real sense um, of how worked something already mm -hmm. is by the time they're bringing it to an editor. And if it's something that hasn't gone through a lot of stages and they're, they're doing it, to pay the rent, and the, you know, and they're they're going to be receptive. They're going to be looking, hopefully, for lots of editing. And if someone is bringing something, like I um, worked, I did a, I edited a poetry uh, collection for um, Phoneme's sister press, unnamed press, Uyghurland, and it was clearly, you know, the product of many many years of work and, and already so polished and worked that I was just looking. I mean, it wasn't a proofreader, a copy edit, but I was still mostly just looking for an internal internal consistency. I wasn't going to try to go back. I don't, what do I know about, you know, the Uyghur language and the whole context, the whole thing. The translator was the authority. And so something that comes, maybe like Diorama, that, that comes from a place that's so much more labored over already, you're just looking for an editor to bounce back some questions to say, this is what you meant to be doing right. This is what the text, this is what I see the text doing. Are you looking for more feedback? Or are we just, you know, just going to say, you seem to be changing the way you're using commas. Maybe think about that here. Or do I need to get in there and start tearing apart lines? Has everything to do with what stage the translation is at when it comes to you? Well, Uyghur land's available in the bookstore <laughs> uh, if you'd like to see it. It's handiwork. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, nothing. <laughs> Any last question from anyone? Well, thank you guys for, for doing this. Thank you guys for coming out. Yeah.